Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, I'm going to give you a short explanation as to what the all or none principle is in less than 10 minutes. So with that, let's give it a go. So I'd like to start off first with an experiment explaining to you the difference between a sub-threshold potential and an action potential. So let's first start off by looking at what a sub-threshold potential is. So in order to understand the difference between these two things, I have a hypothetical experiment in which we have a neuron. Now, attached to this neuron are three different lines, and all of these lines are attached to different locations on the axon. So line one is he attached here, line two is attached here, and then line three is attached here. Now, attached to these lines is going to be a monitor. So this monitor is going to measure the membrane potential. Now, the most important part to this monitor that I want to show you is this part, which has a dotted red line. So this part is going to be um, the threshold potential. So this is the potential at which the inward current is greater than the outward current. So remember that current is just the movement of positive charge. So when the inward current or the amount of positive charge moving into the cell is greater than the amount of positive charge moving out of the cell, this is going to mean that the cell has reached threshold and therefore will fire an action potential. So I just want to first look at how an action potential varies from a sub-threshold potential. So in order to start this experiment, let's get a stimulus. And let's just say the stimulus is a sub-threshold potential. So we're going to measure it at line 1. And line 1 is where the stimulus originated. So this is where we implanted the stimulus. So this stimulus at line 1 looks something like this. So what we see here is that the cell starts at rest. And then when the stimulus is implanted, which would be around right here, the cell depolarizes up to a certain point, and then the stimulus will decay back down to the resting potential. So what we see here is that the stimulus failed to reach the threshold, so it didn't create an action potential. So how would this stimulus look at line 2? So if we were to look at line 2 at the same stimulus, because remember the stimulus is going to travel down the axon, what we would see is that the stimulus has decayed over a certain distance. So we see, first of all, that the stimulus starts at a later time because it takes time for the stimulus to travel down the axon. And the stimulus goes, went to a lower level of depolarization. So instead of coming up to here, the stimulus only went down to he, up to here. So that we see the same sort of thing, that the cell starts at rest, and then after that, it depolarizes and then it repolarizes back down to the resting potential. Now let's look at the final location, which is the furthest location away from the stimulus origin. So what would it look like in line 3? Well, in line 3, it would look even smaller than it did in line 2. So what is the conclusion of this experiment? Well, the conclusion is that if we have a sub-threshold stimulus, the stimulus will decay and fail to fire an action potential, and it decays as a function of distance from the stimulus origin, as we saw here. Because as we went from line 1 all the way to line 3, the level of depolarization that we saw decreased. So the stimulus is going to decay if it's sub-threshold. So what if the stimulus were enough to initiate an action potential? So if we were to repeat the experiment and we have a stimulus originate at line 1, the stimulus now is high enough in order to surpass the threshold. So remember that the threshold is going to be the point at which the amount of inward current is greater than the amount of outward current. So in this case, the cell surpasses threshold, which allows it to fire an action potential. So what would this signal look like at line 2? So as we increase distance away from the stimulus origin, what we see is that that initial stimulus, the initial stimulus that started the action potential, is going to be smaller. But the action potential itself, which is right here, is going to be the same size. So in other words, the graded stimulus that initiated the action potential decreased in strength, while the action potential maintained its strength. So what about at line 3? At line 3, we see a similar thing, 
where the initial graded stimulus decreased in strength, but the action potential maintained its strength. So from this experiment, we, we see that if the stimulus reaches the threshold, the neuron will fire an action potential. And as the action potential propagates, the action potential size and shape maintains constant. It remains the same. But the graded stimulus that started the action potential will degrade over the distance. So now that we know that action potentials are sort of self-sustaining, let's talk about why these action potentials don't degrade and why they look different than a graded potential. And this will help us understand what the all or none principle is. So in order to understand what the all or none principle is, we have to understand feedback cycles. So in the action potential, there are two feedback cycles. The first is going to be the voltage-gated sodium channel cycle. So for the first feedback cycle, for the voltage-gated sodium channel cycle, we first have a depolarization. This depolarization will open the voltage-gated sodium channels, which allows sodium to flow into the cell. And when sodium flows into the cell, it depolarizes the cell further, which allows more voltage-gated sodium channels to open. So it keeps feeding forward as it opens more and more voltage-gated sodium channels, allowing that upstroke that we see in the action potential. So this positive feedback cycle with the voltage-gated sodium channels is going to be responsible for that depolarization that we see in the action potential. Now, the second feedback cycle that we see has to do with the potassium channels. So, th so the voltage-gated potassium channels are also opened by depolarization. However, they cause potassium to flow out of the cell or exit the cell. This results in a hyperpolarization, which therefore inhibits the voltage-gated potassium channels, therefore closing them. So the voltage-gated sodium channels are regulated by a positive feedback cycle, whereas the potassium channels work off of a negative feedback cycle. So these feedback cycles are going to be incredibly important in determining the all or none principle. So now that we know what these feedback cycles are, let's actually talk about what the all or none principle is. So in order to understand what the all or none principle is, we're going to do a little experiment here. So let's just say we have a monitor and it's a computer that can map out action potentials. And this red line here is going to be the threshold. So the threshold potential is negative 55 millivolts. Now let's say attached to this computer, we have a stimulus generator. So this uh, generator can basically produce different stimuluses, which can therefore produ either produce an action potential or not produce an action potential, depending on whether it reaches threshold or not. So to start this experiment, let's just bring in this level of stimulus. So this is a depolarizing stimulus, which will now go into the computer. So let's see what results on the monitor. So what we see here is that the stimulus was a sub-threshold stimulus. So the stimulus wasn't able to reach the threshold potential, so therefore no action potential was produced. Therefore, the sub-threshold potential just caused a depolarization, which, th which then repolarized and went back down to resting. So in other words, this stimulus degraded. So now let's uh, look at another stimulus, which is slightly stronger. So what we see here is that the stimulus is stronger, and in this case, it reaches the threshold. Now, this stimulus is just strong enough to exactly reach the threshold. So it exactly reaches the threshold, and then after it reaches the threshold, it has a little delay, but it then initiates a full-sized action potential. So what we see here is that there is a sharp threshold that determines whether an action potential will be fired. If the stimulus is lower than the threshold, no action potential is fired. But if it reaches the threshold, then an action potential can be fired. So what if we were to increase the signal strength? Well, if we were to produce a stronger stimulus, which we see by the orange line here, what we pr would produce is this resulting action potential. So what we see here, first of all, is that the cell reaches threshold at a faster rate because the stimulus is stronger. But what we see here is that the action potential is actually around the same size as the first one. Even though we increased the stimulus strength 
we still got the same sized action potential. We still got a full sized action potential that isn't varying in height really at all. So what if we were to produce an even stronger stimulus? Well, if we were to produce an even stronger stimulus, which we see here by the green line, what we would see is the following. So the first thing is that we see is that the stimulus surpassed the threshold. And as a result, it produced an action potential. But even though this stimulus was stronger than the previous one, the action potential was still the same size. So the first thing that we saw with this experiment was that the subthreshold stimulus failed to initiate an action potential. But when the stimulus reached threshold, an action potential was fired. And as we increased the stimulus strength, the, ampl the amplitude of the action potential did not change. So what does all or none mean? So all or none really has three parts to its definition. So the first thing is, is that when we say that an action potential is all or none, we mean that there is a clear threshold where the stimulus intensity must reach in order to fire an action potential. Now, this threshold is going to depend upon the cell type and uh, how many channels are there, etc. But there, it, in order to start an action potential, we need to reach the threshold. And if it reaches the threshold, then an action potential is going to fire. So in other words, when we say that an action potential is an all or none process, we're saying that the action potential has a clear threshold where the stimulus much reached in order to initiate an action potential. The second point of what all or none means is that once the threshold is reached, the feedback cycles are going to be initiated. So in other words, what this means is that the feedback cycles are going to take over the production of the action potential. So the feedback cycles are so powerful that they are self-sustaining and they overtake the initial stimulus. And it's because of these feedback cycles that the initial stimulus has really a minimal effect on the size or shape of the action potential. And that's why no matter what the uh, initial signal intensity was, the size of the action potential will pretty much remain the same. Now, it's important to realize that the all or none principle doesn't mean that every single action potential will be the same size or shape because different experimental and physiological conditions can actually produce different sizes and shapes of action potentials. The main thing that it's trying to portray are these two points here. That first, there is a clear threshold where the stimulus must reach in order to fire an action potential. And the second point is that once the threshold is reached, the uh, feedback cycles are initiated, which take over the action potential, which therefore overtake the initial stimulus, which cause them to be basically the same size and shape. So that's what all or none means. And I hope that this video helped you understand what all or none means. And, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. And I hope to see you next time.